Hare Krishna. Om Jnana Chimarandasya, Jnananjana, Shalakaya, Chakshur Umbalitang, Yena, Tasmai Sri Gurve Nama. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gradha, Shivasari Gaur Bhaktarinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare, Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Rama, Rama, Hare, Hare. <clears throat> We're continuing our discussion tonight of Narada Muni's outreach to the sons of Daksha. Remember how this all started. It's about material existence and the notion that to get over it, you have to go through it. So-called learning by experience. This is what Daksha advocated and this is why he was so angry at Narada Muni. You've prevented my sons from heavenly material enjoyment. And without that experience, how are they going to give it up? In Narada's presentation to the Haryasapas, Daksha's sons, you see the power of hearing in its full potential. Just by hearing the words of Narada Muni, spoken as an allegory, the Hayasvas got it. They considered what Narada Muni said with their natural intelligence. They were that sharp that just by hearing once this allegory, they understood what they should do. Let's repeat that allegory with its 10 elements. And then we'll deal with further elements of that allegory. We dealt with the first two some days ago. The great sage Narada said, my dear Hayaspas, you have not seen the extremities of the earth. There is a kingdom where only one man lives and where there is a hole from which, having entered, no one emerges. A woman there, who is extremely unchaste, adorns herself with various attractive dresses. And the man who lives there is her husband. In that kingdom, there is a river flowing in both directions. A wonderful home made of 25 materials. A swan that vibrates various sounds. And an automatically revolving object made of sharp razors and thunderbolts. You have not seen all this. And therefore you are inexperienced boys without advanced knowledge. How then will you create progeny? He's telling them, I know your father sent you here to prepare yourselves for each one of you having a massive dynasty. And for that purpose, you were performing so many austerities, penances, meditations, so on. But you're, right, you're not ready. You don't know what I... I'm telling you, you don't understand. How are you going to go on with life without this knowledge that I'm speaking to you? <clears throat> you don't know about that place with just one male, that kingdom with just one male. You haven't seen the far off corners 
of the earth. You don't know about a hole of which when someone enters, they never re they're never seen to return. You don't know about that. The tenth element is in another verse. What I read you has nine. Here's number ten. Alas, your father is omniscient, but you do not know his actual order. Without knowing the actual purpose of your father, how are you going to, how will you create progeny? We'll get to that number 10 allegorical element in the coming days. But for now, let's talk about that whole of which one someone disappears into and never is and they're never seen again <clears throat> in the process of relaying this account you'll remember from the other day we spoke about how in the purports Srila Prabhupada is emphasizing the futility of working hard simply for karmic results, otherwise known as progress, material fulfillment, material satisfaction, material advancement. We don't condone hard work in bhakti, simply let us work hard for Krishna. We spoke about the extremities of the earth not being seen by the Hyasvas. You remember that refers to the countless gross bodies that the subtle body of the living entity takes on. Now when you say you haven't seen all the bodies and all that the subtle body drives you through, you haven't seen that. Countless varieties of nature. You don't understand that. What's your plan to stop this? In other words, Narada Muni is telling them, I want to destroy your karma. That's how we're going to deal with the K word. I'm going to give you instructions by which you'll escape the grip of karma. And then there's the kingdom with only one male. You remember what that's about? Only one enjoyer, Krishna. He's Bhagavan, full of, unlimitedly full of six opulences. He's completely independent, self-reliant. A true enjoyer has to have those characteristics. And you can just see in our meager attempts to enjoy. We don't have unlimited opulences. Nor are we independent. Our enjoyment is dependent on so many factors. And it's very frustrating. <clears throat> so Narada Muni is making the point that if human society doesn't understand this soul enjoyer, the supreme enjoyer, then what's the use in all this hard work for temporary so-called benefits? Another term for the Supreme Personality God it is Abhava. Has no material existence. We've been talking about Bhava, material existence, and Bhava, the preliminary state of pure love of Krishna. But for Krishna, there's no bhava. There's just a bhava. He's unborn. There's no question of creation or annihilation for him. 
Narada Muni is telling these boys, why don't you understand him? Have a lifestyle keyed on understanding that supreme enjoyer. That solitary male in the kingdom. <clears throat> now, we're up to number three. The hole in which someone enters and is never seen again. This refers to both the lower planetary system as well as Vaikuntha. If someone through material entanglement enters the lower planetary system, what does it mean that they're never seen again? It's this eternal damnation? No, it's just that the process of material entanglement and its results is so lengthy that it's like you can't see the end of it. There is an end to it, but the depth of the entanglement can be beyond human calculation. You don't know where it begins and you can't see where it ends. And because of attachment, even though there's suffering and hard work for such meager so-called pleasure, still one can't give it up because of that attachment. What about the opposite? That whole that someone enters into and, and is never seen again also applies in Narada Muni's allegory to Vaikuntha. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, once having gone there, one never returns to material existence. The lesson of undergoing material existence once we can see it for what it is, makes it so that never again, truly never again. Does that come from experience? Not exactly. Yes, we're frustrated. Yes, we're tormented and disappointed by material existence. But all that in of itself is not sufficient for us to Drop it. We need association with the devotee of Krishna. And by that mercy from the devotee, which can take root, the seed can take root in the fertile soil of material exasperation. Then our pathway out of material existence is cleared. So it's not just by experience of material existence. Having experienced it, I'll never go back. So, in other words, I, gotta I have to experience it first. Now, Krishna has established contact points throughout material existence where conditioned souls can contact a devotee. Sometimes people question why, if there's a God, why has he just left us in material existence? But that's not the case. Spread over countless lifetimes in so many species of life are opportunities to contact a devotee. Narada Muni continues with his presentation. Number four. A professional prostitute. These days, that's male or female. <laughs> A 
Narada Muni is referring, and the Hayas has understood, to materially contaminated intelligence, which changes its clothes, so to speak, based on varied experiences of material life. But those changes of clothes are to the detriment of the living entity. The various attire that contaminated intelligence wears, meaning the conceptions that it takes on, bewilder the living entity. I remember an experience I had in one city in New Zealand. I had finished speaking at the Bhakti Lounge and with another devotee I was walking back to where I stayed and the street was like three lanes of traffic and it was a Saturday night around nine o'clock so I saw one young lady wearing a leather coat and high leather boots and she was dangling from a stop sign pole at the side of this street full of traffic and sticking her leg out in the oncoming traffic. So I just thought she's troubled by something and I was with another devotee so I just asked, is everything all right? Just looked at me with astonishment and said, I need money. Uh, then I, um, I think I better keep walking. <laughs> so our contaminated intelligence is like that. It's provoking us. Provocative, changing conceptions, changing opinions, but it's all material intelligence unfortified, unpurified by transcendental knowledge. So it gets us into trouble. The verse says, mixed with the mode of passion, the unsteady intelligence of every living entity is like a prostitute who changes dresses just to attract one's attention. If one fully engages in temporary fruit of activities, not understanding how this is taking place, what does he actually gain? What is the use of all this superficial karma, that superficial intelligence entangles the living entity in? We want to develop the discrimination by which we place our intelligence in Krishna. Narada Muni goes further to describe that this prostitute has a spouse. Obviously, the spouse is in for a rough ride. <clears throat> the spouse of a prostitute loses all independence. The intelligence is polluted And the jiva in its conditioned state is dragged here and there by the polluted intelligence, like a spouse who has such a unchaste partner is dragged here and there through so many torturous circumstances. Although frustrated by the experience, the spouse can't break free. So bhakti yoga involves the purification of intelligence. Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, Bahushaka hinantascha 
Budayovia Vasayana. The intelligence that's contaminated has so many branches. Whereas for a devotee, Ekeha Kudanandana, focused on Krishna's pleasure. Let's discuss a bit about Naraduni's method of presentation. <clears throat> we spoke earlier about how Naraduni has various methods for approaching different persons. With the Haryasvas, he spoke seemingly very puzzling words. With the father of the Prachetas in the fourth canto, you read about King Prachina Barisha. Another king who had sent his sons off to perform austerities. And his sons... ended up going much deeper in life and they recited a famous song Rudra Gita they sang song of Lord Shiva which is totally dedicated to the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narada Muni again is thinking about the family line. Good families have significance. In the case of the Haryaspas, Narayana is thinking, Daksha and his children are all in the line of Swayambhuva Manu. So those boys of Daksha, they deserve a better deal coming in such an illustrious line. Similarly, Narad Muni thought that about the Prachetas. They're coming in the line of Dhruva Maharaj. <laughs> so let me try to deliver the father, Prachina Bharisha. In approaching the king, He narrowed when he cut to the chase straight away. Shreyas Twam Katamad Rajan Karmanatmana Ihase Dukahani Sukhavapti Shreyas Tan Neha Cheshite. My dear king. What do you desire to achieve by performing these fruit of activities? The chief aim of life is to get rid of all miseries and enjoy happiness. But these two things cannot be realized by fruit of activity. This is a real sutra, essential truth spoken concisely. My dear king, you're performing all these karmic activities. And we know what the goal is. Get rid of misery and enjoy happiness. But I've got something, I've got news for you. It seems counterintuitive and opposite to what you may ordinarily think, but here is the fact. You cannot achieve these two things by karma. Really stops us in our tracks. Like, well, what am I supposed to do if I can't act to get rid of all miseries and to enjoy happiness? What am I supposed to do? This is why, even more necessary than our understanding, we're spirit soul, we're not the body, is our understanding of spiritual activities. 
spiritual desires. And that's why we discuss bhava. So we can start to feel the or aspire for spiritual emotions, spiritual relationships, and more seva, spiritual service. The purport keeps us on track here in this verse. In this material world, there's a great illusion which covers real intelligence. Now I want you to feel how our intelligence is covered, like the clouds covering the sun. How is my intelligence covered by a, a great illusion? The explanation given is that although passionately we work hard to derive some benefit, to get some goal, to achieve something, time will never allow us, you know, to enjoy anything permanently. You know that. But here's what we figure. Although time will not allow me to enjoy anything permanently, I'll have some magic moments, some happy moments. I'll have my day in the sun. And as people often say, live to become a memory. Just do something so that wherever and whenever you're gone to wherever you go, people will remember that about you. Live to become a memory. We need to understand the bhakti science of happiness. You see, the problem with karma, karmic goals, is not simply that the results are temporary. The problem is also about the results themselves. What we're longing for is pure happiness. Happiness unmixed with frustration or anxiety or distress. That's not possible in the material world. The sukha is always laced with anxiety, disappointment, frustration. But please focus on this phenomenon. We, we want to drink up pure happiness. It doesn't exist in the material world. I like the example of sweet rice mixed with sand. Devotees love sweet rice, especially from made from milk given by protected cows, thick and creamy, chilled before it's served to you. The sweet rice is cooked slowly. So you lift the cup of sweet rice to your lips, ready for the pure taste. And as you're drinking it, crunch, crunch, crunch. What is this? There's sand in it. You keep on drinking, thinking, I'll get past the sand and we'll get the pure nectarian taste of the sweet rice. But no, crunch, crunch, crunch. What would you do in those situations? Generally, what we would do is, even though we're frustrated, we keep drinking because this is what you're supposed to do. And this is supposed to be happiness. I can't stop. Okay, even though there's sand in the sweet rice, it's, I've got, I've got sweet rice. I just have to tolerate the sand. I guess that's the best you can do. In this way, we're so dedicated, so determined. 
if we could only be so determined and tolerant in the execution of our devotional service. So think about it. Sweet rice mixed with sand. Sometimes you say, "Not nah, take the cup away. I, I just just tired of crunching on the sand, even though the taste of sweet rice mixed in with the sand is so nice." But ah, uh, but then uh, bring the cup back. You know, you know. After all, you know, I guess that's life. You know, that's what the people say. You know, nothing else to do anyway. It's frustration. In this way, we allow ourselves attracted by unclean intelligence we allow ourselves to be dragged through so many embarrassing frustrating situations and sooner or later everyone encounters these so please think about it pure happiness can't be found in this world so this is what Narada Muni is explaining to King Prachina Barsha. I know the chief aim of life, Narada Muni is telling him, as ordinarily conceived. I know that you want to rid yourself of all distresses and enjoy pure happiness. But it can't happen the way you're going about it. Karmic activity cannot achieve these goals because that very activity brings problems and simply gives the illusion that things will be better, that there'll be progress, there'll be fulfillment. So this is what Srila Prabhupada is talking about when he says, in this material world, there's a great illusion which covers real intelligence. So the jiva, as a conditioned soul in the material world, is shackled, is, according to the allegory, married to that kind of unchaste intelligence. Unchaste intelligence, like a prostitute. We want to work hard to achieve benefit. But remember, time won't allow you to enjoy anything permanently. And even temporary enjoyment is so problematic because of what it's always mixed with. Saturated by the modes of material nature. There's another aspect to this whole illusion. That is that we're so foolish, we think that just the process of working hard for material goals is happiness. Now, how can that be? While we're struggling and work, remember, in the Shastric sense, means trying to achieve anything, not just a salary job or business, profit-making business. We misconstrue the work, the struggle, as enjoyable. How do we do that? The, the intelligence, the, un, the contaminated intelligence concocts. Because while we're doing those activities of struggle we're in our mind's eye seeing a pleasurable outcome anticipation in other words expectation it's a mental concoction so that's how even when we're laboring hard in whatever way trying to achieve something obtain something we sometimes think uh, we mistake that as happiness. It's rewarding because in our mind's eye we see what I'm doing is going to bring me a certain experience. So what we're relishing is on the mental platform as we struggle, 
push forward with our material minds and senses. We're visualizing the end result. I've spoken often about this. It's called emotional forecasting, the impact bias terminology given by behavioral economists. And we've heard how the human being as depicted by these social scientists always overshoots the mark with his or her anticipation or estimation of the future emotional bang that a particular work or struggle or endeavor is going to bring. Always overshoots the mark. So in other words, we get worked up in the mind. I'm going to do this in order to get that. And because I'm going to get that, while I'm doing this, I'm also kind of happy, even though it's a struggle, you know, and it's labor, but I'm thinking ahead what I'm going to get. I can just taste it now. But when that actual experience or event comes, if you actually achieve your end result, that result never matches your expectations. This is called the impact bias. We have a bias or disposition or prejudice to always overestimate the emotional impact, the emotional bang that we're going to get. Narada Muni knows all that and, and so much more. So therefore he says, your two goals for which you're performing karma can never be achieved. Karma never brings about those results of freedom from distress and the acquisition of enjoyment. All you really get are problems. And those problems sometimes masquerade as happiness. Take some deep thought to understand this. <clears throat> as Prabhupada writes, indeed, this process of working hard is actually taken for happiness. This is called illusion. Time for some aspirations for bhava. We've done our share tonight of bhava, discussing material existence. And now we're going to flip the page to abhava, Krishna who has no becoming and unbecoming. So we ended yesterday speaking from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and making the point that even so-called bad qualities, what you would normally consider bad qualities in Krishna are all auspicious and perfect. These so-called bad qualities have a role in Krishna's pastimes, his protecting of his devotees. Everything is there in the Supreme Absolute Truth. So we ended discussing one of the four personality types of Krishna. We ended discussing Dirod Dutta personality type of haughtiness. Who likes a haughty person? <laughs> Rupa Goswami explains, remember? The wise call a person Dirod Dutta when he shows envy, pride, deceit by magical tricks, anger, fickleness, and a boastful nature. 
Who would like that kind of person? <laughs> and you may remember the example we concluded with. Krishna talking rowdy. Or in some countries they call it trash talking. When you like when athletes deride an opposing player on the court or on the field. Who are you? You're useless. <laughs> they try to psychologically intimidate the opponent. Basketball players are famous for that in the USA. And in cricket, it's said the Australian cricket team is known for that. <laughs> Sledging is the Aussie slang for it, for, for trash talking. So, you remember what Krishna said to Kalyavana. Hey, sinful king of the Yavanas. Yavanas. Hey, frog, go away now and build yourself a house on the bottom of a dark well. I, the black snake called Krishna, am waiting in front, ready to swallow you. Just by glancing casually upwards, I can turn the whole universe to ashes. So this also is about not simply haughtiness in terms of pride and envy, but especially envy, but Krishna is showing his power of deceitful magic. That's one of the characteristics of haughtiness. He's suggesting, remember he said, just by my glancing casually upwards into the sky, in other words, I can turn the whole universe into ashes. <laughs> so he's presenting himself as possessing that power, which of course he does, but <laughs> Jiva Goswami says, <laughs> this is deceit because he actually doesn't do such a thing. <laughs> but he's talking in that way. <laughs> I can turn the whole universe to ashes just by glancing up at the sky. Watch out. <laughs> Normally such envy would be considered a fault. But Krishna is sinless. He acts in his in these ways because it benefits the pastimes, especially protecting devotees. There's another example of this envy, though. Deriding, haughty, haughty condemning. And Rupa Goswami gives this example because it involves Krishna's cowherd boyfriends. And actually, he wants to make sure the train of bhakti, the thread of bhakti is not lost by your mind dwelling on Kaliyavana. <laughs> Let's see how sensitive Rupa Goswami is. All right, you heard about enviousness when Krishna mm, gets in the face of a demon. But here's a nectarian example from Krishna's Cowherd boyfriends. And Krishna's talking to Sri Dhamma, one of his intimate cowherd boy associates. Here I am, he's telling Sri Dhamma. Hey, you dear Sri Dhamma, dear, D E E R, the animal deer. Deer are not very powerful, they're easily frightened, they jump and run away so easily. So he calls one of his best friends, Sri Dhamma, a deer. What am I doing, Krishna is saying? I'm creating the illusion of being a heavy cloud that's descended. That heavy cloud is me like an elephant. And I'm raising my formidable elephant trunk. And I'm making terrifying trumpeting sounds 
I am the monstrous, irrepressible elephant called Krishna. <laughs> now, Sri Dhamma, you dear, flee from the battlefield. They're sporting <laughs> in the forest in Vrindavan. <laughs> so this is mock derision, mock condemnation, deriding, enviousness. <laughs> Krishna's comparing himself to a heavy cloud as the foremost elephant with the formidable trunk and the terrifying roar. <laughs> so Rupa Goswami makes the point that some of these qualities seem to contradict each other. But everything is possible in Krishna because Krishna's powers are unrestricted. So even something like envy is all part of his wonderful qualities. He's the shelter of everything. He controls everything. So in Krishna, you can see the perfection of envy. To illustrate the contradictions in Krishna, Rupa Goswami brings in a quote from the Gorma Purana. The Supreme Lord is neither large nor small, yet he is both large and small. He is said to be colorless, yet he is blackish with a tinge of red at the corners of his eyes. Thus by his power, he possesses contrary qualities. Nonetheless, one should never find any fault in the transcendental Lord. Though his qualities are contrary, they are completely reconciled in him. Krishna is beyond material fault and he's beyond material virtue. There's an interesting understanding of Krishna Tattva presented in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu about what are apparently 18 great defects. So first, the points established that the form of Krishna is totally devoid of the 18 great defects. But then Rupa Goswami goes on to show how these 18 great defects are false in connection with Krishna and his love for his devotees are all perfectly good qualities. This is how inconceivably glorious Krishna is that even the 18 great faults of material existence in him are not material and they are delights in his dealings with his devotees. So what are those 18 great faults? They're listed as bewilderment, sleep, making mistakes, material attachment, excessive lust, fickleness, intoxication, envy, violence, exhaustion, toil, lying, anger, hankering, worry, anxiety about the world, prejudice, and dependency on others. Sounds like us, doesn't it? But these faults Jiva Goswami wants to make sure we understand in Krishna because they're in connection to Krishna's love for his devotees. They're considered good qualities. So he gives an example for almost all of these 18 great 
defects of material existence. It's a formidable list, those 18, and it's a great way for us to understand what the struggle for material existence is all about. But in Krishna, you have something else. So the first one, bewilderment. How does Krishna show that? Remember, Brahma Vimohana Leela. Brahma meddled in Krishna's pastimes. Apparently, removing the cowherd boys. And so, Krishna came back to where the cowherd boys were, and they were gone. What happened? Evidently, Krishna was bewildered. We know that Krishna's having fun. Oh, what happened? What to do? Where are my cowherd boyfriends? He's having fun. But still, it's moha. It's bewilderment. <laughs> Imperfection. So what does the Bhagavatam say? Tato vatsan adrist vaitya puline picha vatsapan ubhavapi vene krishno vichikaya samantataha Thereafter, when Krishna was unable to find the calves, he returned to the bank of the river. But there he was also unable to see the cowherd boys. Thus he began to search for both the calves and the boys as if he could not understand what had happened. <laughs> as if he could not understand what had happened. So this is moha in Krishna Leela as experienced by Krishna. It's all for his unlimited pleasure and for the pleasure of his loving associates. What about sleep, exhaustion, toil? Who wants to suffer from lack of sleep, who wants to be exhausted, and who wants the toil of hard labor and the feeling that comes after that. But in Krishna Leela, even those great material defects are unlimitedly all attractive. <laughs> we'll go to the 15th chapter of the 10th canto. Quachit palabatal peshu nayudda shama karshitaha vriksha mulashraya chete gapot sango pabarhanaha. Sometimes Lord Krishna grew tired from fighting and lay down at the base of a tree, resting upon a bed made of soft twigs and buds and using the lap of a cowherd friend as his pillow. So yes, there's sleepiness, exhaustion from toil, but it is all Satchitananda, eternity, knowledge, and bliss. Krishna and his associates relish being active and playing very vigorously, and they also relish Oh, Krishna, use the lap of one of your cowherd boyfriends as your pillow. Take rest. You're tired from mock fighting. <laughs> what about mistakes? Brahma. You find that also in Krishna. What? How can Krishna make mistakes? No, it's Leela. <laughs> All for the pleasure of his associates. 
we go to the eighth chapter of the tenth canon. When Krishna and Balaram were infants, they used to crawl around on their hands and knees in the mud of Brudge. That mud's created by cow dung and cow urine. Their ankle bells were jingling. And at the same time, they were very much pleased by the sound of other people's ankle bells. They're little. So that's why they're crawling. So attracted by the sound of other people's ankle bells, they used to follow these people as if they were going to their mothers. But then they realized, after following for some time, crawling after these people, ah, these are not our mothers. This is not Rohini. This is not Yashoda. Ah. And they became afraid and crawled back to their real mothers, Yashoda and Rohini. Mistake! <laughs> No, it's Krishna, a Krishna mistake, <laughs> full of simply eternity, knowledge, and bliss. No modes of material nature, no material defect. What we would normally consider a defect, making a mistake, in Krishna Lila, we glorify Krishna eternally for it. Briefly, Jiva Goswami discusses the great defect of material attachment, Ruksha Rasata. That's material attachment without praying. But in Krishna, all the attachment is about praying. Then there's excessive lust, Ubanakama. Material lust, and that certainly brings grief. But that doesn't exist in Krishna because his kama, his so called lust, is simply in the form of prem, pure love. The next one, fickleness, lolita, also in Krishna is a sublime quality. Generally, you don't like to be around fickle people. Their minds change. You don't know which way the wind is blowing. Like a little kid, one moment he's laughing, next minute he's screaming, crying. But in Krishna, fickleness is infinitely attractive. And this is the example given. Our dear friend Yashoda, your son sometimes comes to our houses before the milking of the cows and releases the calves. And when the master of the house becomes angry, your son merely smiles. Sometimes he devises some process by which he steals palatable curd, butter and milk, which he then eats and drinks. When the monkeys assemble, he divides it with them. And when the monkeys have their bellies so full that they won't take any more, he breaks the pots. Sometimes, if he gets no opportunity to steal butter or milk from a house, he will be angry at the householders, and for his revenge, he will agitate the small children by pinching them. Then, when the children begin crying, Krishna will go away. So the older gopis are reporting Krishna's activities of fickleness to Yashoda Mata. They're actually thinking, you may not have seen this, what your son's doing, but we want to inform you because <laughs> actually it's so adorable. We don't want you to miss out. So we're telling you what's he, what he's doing when he breaks into our houses. They reported that sometimes if Krishna couldn't find any milk products or babies to pinch, he would just 
defecate, apparently, in a sacred worship room of their house, the house that he had entered into. And he would enter those houses by first having spies amongst his little babe friends. And they would let him know the situation, the coast is clear, green light, you can sneak into this house. But if he couldn't find any mischief to do, he would apparently defecate in the house. But the Acharyas point out, as I mentioned in a class I gave in my apartment, it's, it's an apparent defecation. Supreme Personality God, it doesn't have any <laughs> waste to, <laughs> to get rid of. But he creates that mm, appearance. So fickleness. This is why the residents of Vrindavan would become puzzled when they would see little Krishna do something so extraordinary. Who is he? On the one hand, we see he gets hungry. If you don't give him attention, he cries. He likes being pampered. But then on the other hand, we've seen him do this. Or his cowherd, little cowherd friends have told us he's done that. Who is he? Who is he? How can he be such an inconceivably extraordinary personality when at the same time he's fickle? He even tells lies. He chatters endlessly. <laughs> It's so wonderful to discuss Krishna's qualities. We don't want to spend our whole life discussing puny human attributes. Certainly, we want to be knowledgeable of human beings and the way they're conditioned, psychology manifests. without having a significant portion of our life dedicated to understanding Krishna's qualities. We won't escape the clutches of the material energy. But just by hearing about Krishna's qualities, as we seek to understand Krishna's energy, his material energy, his living entities, but understanding Krishna's qualities, it's our transcendental reward. Each of us needs to have that experience that just by hearing about Krishna, my consciousness changes, my life changes. When you have that experience, then you're really ready to move ahead in bhakti. We should beg for that experience. Simply by hearing about Krishna, I'm satisfied. And then we want greed. The rarest thing. That Rupa Goswami says, if, if it's sold in any marketplace, buy it all up immediately. Do whatever it takes to get it. Greed to hear about Krishna. Greed to chant Hare Krishna. Greed to serve Krishna. We beg for that perfection of greed, lolium. Should I read one more great defect? Normally what is a great material defect, but in Krishna it's perfect and complete. Intoxication. Mada. Mada Vagorni Talochna Ishat. Mana Daswa Suhidam Banamali. Badara Pandu Badano Midu Gandam. Mandayan Kanaka Kundala Lakshmya. 
intoxication. As Krishna respectfully greets his well-wishing friends, his eyes roll slightly as if from intoxication. He wears a flower garland and the beauty of his soft cheeks is accentuated by the brilliance of his golden earrings and the whiteness of his face, which has the color of a butter of berry. Again, from the 10th canto. This gets so juicy. I have to do one more. Don't mind, please. Envy, Matsarya. Oh, certainly a great defect in material existence. Enviousness is such a contamination. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur compares it to when envy overcomes us. He says, you have a wild boar who has passed stool on your head. As I often explain, envy is indirect appreciation. Often I get this question. What do I do about envy? But you only envy someone who has something better or is doing something better or is better. You don't envy anyone who's worse off. <laughs> so if someone, if a devotee is better, has done better, instead of indirectly appreciating through envy, directly appreciate how nicely you're doing, how wonderful you have done. I'm inspired to also try to do better. Your example inspires me. So instead of the indirect appreciation of envy, just directly appreciate. Because remember, as I said, you only envy someone who has something better, not worse. You don't envy a distressed person. In fact, pe people often have that expression when they see someone in a tough situation. They just say, I don't envy you. <laughs> the flip side of that is, well, if you, if you were in a better situation, I would envy you. But in your present situation, I don't envy you. <laughs> so if someone's in, a, if a devotee is doing better service, and of course we think everyone's doing better service than me, then just appreciate. <laughs> Express that appreciation. What's an example of how the great material defect, one of the 18 great material defects in Krishna is perfect and complete? How does that envy manifest in Krishna Leela? Again from the 10th canto. <clears throat> Tatra Pratividim Sangyag Atma Yogena Sadhaye Lokesha Maninam Modhyad Tanishye Sri Madang Tamaha. This is Krishna speaking. By my mystic power, I will completely counteract this disturbance caused by Indra. Demigods like Indra are proud of their opulence, and out of foolishness they falsely consider themselves the Lord of the universe. I will now destroy such ignorance. Krishna is announcing. I'm going to take care of Indra. He doesn't say he's going to destroy him. He says, I'm going to destroy such ignorance. What about violence? In Bhatriya Samrita Sindhu, the Acharyas point out that there's so many examples of Krishna 
applying violence. So, therefore, they didn't feel it's necessary to present examples of that. But lying? Yes. Krishna tells lies and they're considered inconceivably and unlimitedly glorious and worshipable. The example given is when Krishna and the Pandavas tricked Jarasandha, challenging him for a fight. And also, the famous pastime from the 8th chapter of the 10th canto, in which apparently Krishna ate dirt. Naham bakshi tavanamba sarve mitya bisham sinaha yadi satya giras tahi samaksham pasha me mukam. My dear mother, I've never eaten dirt. All my friends complaining against me are liars. If you think they are being truthful, you can directly look into my mouth. And examine it. Krishna's lying. But some say that actually it's not clear whether he actually ate the dirt or not. But that's not the point of the Leela. The point of the Leela is Mother Yashoda's anxiety. The Acharyas point out, as I explained in Mayapur a couple months ago, it could be that Krishna was thinking, okay, I put a little bit of dirt in my mouth, but all the traces of what's in my mouth are now gone. So therefore, when I tell Mother Yashoda I haven't eaten dirt, I am being truthful. There's no dirt in the mouth, and therefore she can look and see, because I've already gotten rid of it. <laughs> That's one angle. In any case, this pastime is used as a classic example of Krishna lying and accusing his cowherd boyfriends as being liars. They're lying. <laughs> They're just angry because I won't play with them anymore. Don't listen to them, mother. <laughs> All right. It's been wonderful talking about Krishna. Remember the Baba Oshadi, the remedy for material existence. We'll see you all again, hopefully, Friday night, New Zealand time. Thank you all for your kind attention and association. Maybe Friday night I should take questions. I can see if you will ask questions for Friday. I'll be able to see them. And if they're good questions, I'll seek to answer them. That's Friday night. All right. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.